Today I'm reacting to the gameplay from The Last of Us 2. You know, the video game. Ladies and gentlemen, can I please have your attention? This is a really violent game. I thought that Mortal Kombat 11 was bad, but this is freaking ridiculous. Okay. This video is sponsored by Human 2.0, your trusted source for online training in body weight exercise, kettlebells, animal flow, primal movement, and injury prevention. Be sure to check them out here on YouTube. Hey interns, I am Dr. Chris Rayner and I am not your everyday ortho. I make sports, injuries, orthopedic surgery, and medical topics easy to understand and entertaining to improve your experience with healthcare. Today for Orthopedic Rounds, I'm going to evaluate and discuss some of the gameplay for the popular game, The Last of Us Part Two. You guys seem to enjoy the Mortal Kombat 11 review, so I thought that I would check out another popular game for you. In this review, I will talk about the medical impact of some of the injuries that are shown, primarily from an orthopedic or surgical point of view. View. I have to provide a disclaimer here. I don't play The Last of Us 2 and I am not familiar with the storyline, so <laughs> you'll have to keep that in mind. With that being said, let's get to it. As this is a longer video, you know what to do if you want to skip ahead. Okay, that's gotta hurt. Yeah, that, that, that'll be a problem. So in this first scene, the character Joel is fighting with a hunter on the second floor above an atrium. The two characters wrestle along the railing momentarily before the glass railing breaks, allowing Joel and the hunter to fall to the ground below. Joel falls backwards and lands on the ground flat on his back. Unfortunately, Joel lands directly onto a piece of exposed rebar, which impales Joel in the abdomen. Yeah. We can see the rebar protruding from his abdomen as he lays on his back. So there are a few things to consider in this scene. First, there is the fall from height. Fortunately, Joel lands on his back in a sprawled position, which helps to dissipate the force of impact over a larger surface area. This is good. However, in falling backwards from a height of approximately 10 feet, there is a good possibility that Joel would suffer from trauma to his head, spinal injuries to any number of levels, and quite possibly long bone fractures of his upper or lower extremities. These injuries could be closed or open where the bones are exposed to the environment outside of the body. Then next we have the issue of the exposed rebar. Now, assuming that no one has been maintaining this particular piece of wayward metal, it is quite likely to be both rusty and dirty. Penetrating injuries that are caused by rusty, dirty metal are often complicated by bacterial infection, particularly tetanus or lockjaw. Given the setting in which the game is based, I am guessing that Joel's tetanus status is not up to date. So this is going to be a potential problem for him. Then, generalized infection of the skin around the wounds, cellulitis, is possible at both the entry and the exit wounds. But so too is infection of anything that is in between those two wounds. Generally speaking, the body is a sterile container with the bacterium that are present within safely cordoned off from the rest of the body in the digestive tract. A penetrating trauma such as this allows bacteria to access otherwise normally sterile areas. And since these areas are warm, dark, and moist, they are the perfect bacterial breeding ground. Next, if we look at the level where Joel has been injured, we can see that he has been punctured in the midline near the level of the navel or the belly button. Obviously, the spine is located centrally, so this would carry with it the risk of injury to the spinal column or the spinal cord. In the event that Joel survives this injury, not bloody likely, <laughs> He might be left a paraplegic with permanent paralysis in his lower extremities. He might also damage other posterior structures such as the kidneys with this type of penetrating trauma. Of course, there are over 15 feet of small bowels and a number of other organs that are folded up in that space. So there is a good possibility that one or several of these organs might also be damaged by the penetrating object. Should that occur, intra-abdominal contents may be spilled from the gut out into the abdomen, creating a very serious problem known as an acute abdomen. This is a surgical emergency that if untreated can lead to generalized infection or sepsis and death. 
If he were unfortunate enough to have perforated the large bowel around the periphery of the abdomen, then an acute abdomen would be even more likely. And that's just because the large bowel is basically full of poop. Poop inside the abdomen, not a good thing. Not to mention the very real possibility of persistent internal bleeding or hemorrhage, which if not controlled, could result in significant blood loss, hemorrhagic shock, and an inability to adequately send blood to vital organs, and ultimately, death. Not a really good way to go. Jesus, what was that? Uh. Yeah, that'll do it. In this next scene, we have the main character jumping down from the roof of a single story building to the ground below to attack another character. The main character performs a stabbing knife attack from above and strikes the other character with a long knife in the upper torso on the left hand side. As she falls through the air towards the character on the ground, we can see that the blade of the knife, which is about six inches long, pointing downwards. The blade strikes the ground based character just beneath her clavicle and penetrates to the level of the blade handle. In jumping from a height in this fashion, at the very least, the impact alone would likely result in a clavicle fracture of some sort on the left side of the person being stabbed. And that's just a fracture of the collarbone. However, with a blade of six inches, there is no doubt that this penetrating injury of the thorax would result in additional injury to the apex of the lung, the subclavian vessels on the left side, the left sided ribs, and possibly even the heart itself. Any one or all of these structures could be damaged by this type of attack. These injuries would cause air to escape from the lungs into the chest cavity, a pneumothorax, blood to escape from the vessels into the chest cavity, a hemothorax, or blood to escape into the pericardial sac around the heart, cardiac tamponade. Neither of these injuries is good and left untreated will certainly result in a fairly precipitous death. For further clarification, that means quick and painful. In the next scene, we have the character engaged in a running battle with a number of assailants. Here, the skirmishes involve a number of weapons in close quarters combat scenarios. She uses a bolt action rifle, a shotgun, a machete, a knife, bow, and a semi-automatic pistol in her skirmishes. At close range, a high powered rifle would be expected to cause a significant amount of damage, not so much on the entry wound, but particularly on the exit wound. While we might not expect the rifle to cause an outright limb amputation, it could quite possibly create a wound that might ultimately require an amputation as a salvage procedure. The shotgun, on the other hand, in a CQB setting is a much more devastating weapon. Depending on the gauge of the ammunition, the length of the barrel, and the choke used on the weapon, we might expect the damage caused to be much more extensive. Here, the weapon is shown to cause amputations of various extremities and to result in obliteration of various body parts. Whether you are talking about the rifle or the shotgun, neither of these weapons is creating injuries that are going to be amenable to orthopedic intervention. It sucks for me, I guess. <laughs> in another encounter, she strikes an opponent with a machete at the junction between the neck and the shoulder with the blade sinking in approximately two to three inches. This blow is almost certainly fatal. With the major vessels from the head and the right upper extremity returning to the heart at this level, it is quite likely that these blood vessels would be damaged, resulting in rapid exsanguination into the chest cavity. Of course, the right clavicle, upper ribs, and possibly also sternum would be cleaved or fractured by the blade as well. In the next skirmish, the main character ambushes an assailant from behind and she dispatches him quickly with a knife to the side of the neck. She stabs her opponent from the right side of the neck, inserting the blade right to the hilt. A six inch blade at this level would transect the major vessels of the neck, such as the carotid arteries and the jugular vein. It would also transect the trachea or windpipe and the esophagus behind it as well. This patient would probably asphyxiate by drowning on his own blood as it flowed into his windpipe, adding insult to injury. In another scene, we have two assailants attacking one of the main characters. They attempt to torture her with a hammer before finishing her off. They hold her down on the ground and repeatedly smash her left forearm with a hammer. This would horribly fracture the bones of the forearm, the radius, and the ulna. 
The fractures would be extremely comminuted or fragmented and could possibly even be open, where the bones penetrate the skin. These fractures would likely not be repairable as a result of the fragmentation. Repeated blows with a hammer would also result in a crush injury to the forearm as well. A compartment syndrome of the forearm, where the pressure within the muscle compartment raises dramatically, would prevent blood and oxygen from traveling into and out of the forearm. Within six hours, tissues within the forearm would start to die and ultimately the forearm itself would become non-viable. It might also become infected, leading to sepsis, causing the character to become systemically unwell, making amputation of the extremity necessary. In a later scene, this character actually has an amputation as a result of this very thing happening. And lest we make garden tools feel neglected in this video game, we have the main character attacking assailants with axes and pickaxes. In one scene, she strikes a blow with an axe, hitting her assailant in the upper back. The axe lodges in the midline between the shoulder blades. At this level, the spinal column would be damaged with likely injury to the spinal cord as well. There would also likely be some injury to the posterior aspect of the upper lobes of the lungs. While the assailant wouldn't immediately die, Paralysis of the lower extremities would definitely be a possibility and a relatively slow death due to bleeding and respiratory or breathing compromise would be probable. In a scene that follows, she proceeds to attack two assailants in short order with a pickaxe. Both are struck in the back with the pickaxe in much the same manner as the axe victim in the midline between the shoulder blades. The results are likely to be the same as with the axe victim. However, given the length of the blade on the pickaxe, additional structures such as the esophagus and the aorta, the main artery leading away from the heart could easily be damaged as well. Either way, this would not be a very pleasant way to go. If you liked the video and you want to see another one, then let me know in the comments. Thanks for watching. I will see you for rounds next week. And as always, that's been a word from Dr. Chris, not your everyday ortho. Just a flesh wound.